is your host normally, but I am filling in for him today. He is lurking in the background and he will be back next month. So don't worry, he's still here and we'll be taking good care of you in future editions. So today we have an exciting topic to talk to you about. We will be talking about building a better culture um, at your game studio. So this is a, a wide topic. I, I don't want you to be limited thinking that just it's only for game development studios because the gems that Jake and Lauren are going to drop can apply in so many different places. So be sure to drop your questions in chat. We will be answering them along the way. And many thanks to the Shell Games marketing team holding it down behind the scenes. So we have Dwayne, he's hanging out in the background, making sure everything's running smoothly. We have Max, uh, he's the tech producer, also helping run the show. Um, Ali, Ali, Ali Cannon is our post-production coordinator. She makes sure the video looks fantastic once we're done with everything that it gets out on our social. Um, Adam, we all know Adam is holding it down in chat and we would be lost without our fearless leader, Jill Shuley. So thank you all so much for all that you do behind the scenes. Um, we have a great show in store for you. So just a bit of background about the awesome guests that I have with me today. Um, in case you missed it, back in July, there was a little announcement from this, you know, publication called gamesindustry.biz um, that Virtuous and Shell Games won the U.S. Best Places to Work 2021 Awards. Round of applause, because that is definitely a great designation. So Virtuous North America, they won in the small companies category, and they also won the awesome special designation of the Education Award. Well, in uh, Shell Games, we won in the mid-size companies category, and we received the Diversity Award. So before I get to our introductions, I'm going to ask chat a quick, quick kickoff question. So think about it, drop your answers in chat. We're gonna answer some of them later. If you had to zero in on one quality of culture that all game studios should consider, we would love to know what it would be and why. So think about it, drop it in chat. We're gonna answer some of that later. I am your host for the evening, Kat DeShields Moon. And now let's get to our panel guests. So Jake, would you do the honors of kicking us off? Sure. Uh, I'm Jake DeGenero. Uh, I'm the general manager here at Virtuous North America, uh, which just means that I oversee our development and partnership groups. Uh, we have locations in Montreal, Los Angeles, Vancouver, and the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, and we're part of a larger company, which is global. We have teams in Dublin and um, Paris and Shanghai and Singapore and Kuala Lumpur and many other places. So uh, I help oversee the teams that we have here on this side of the globe. Awesome, awesome. Wonderful to have you with us this evening. Thank you so much. And Lauren, would you mind introducing yourself? Absolutely. Thanks, Kat. Doing great. Uh, I am the Senior Director of Human Resources at Shell Games. Uh, I'm going on my seventh year here, which is so crazy, uh, but it's my favorite place I've ever worked, uh, best place to work. Uh, it's the longest I've ever worked anywhere, and it is my first job in the games industry. Um, and I'm a big fan of the things that we do in general. Uh, and in particular, my role is in charge of um, everything. I have, an, I have a team that works on the the full employee life cycle at Shell Games. So my personal passion is organizational development and personal and, and professional growth of our team members. So culture is what I live and breathe. So big, big fan. Oh, that's awesome. And you definitely do a great job with it at Shell Games, if I can say so myself. So it takes a village. To <laughs> thank <indeed>. you. <laughs> Um, so before we get to a couple other introductory items, I would love to pose a kickoff question to the two of you. Why is a positive studio culture so important to you? Uh, Jake, would you mind taking that question first? Sure. Um, I mean, it's we work in a, in a creative passion driven industry, um, first and foremost. I mean, I know for myself, I knew since I was a teenager, I wanted to make games and I, it took me a while to figure out in what capacity, what role I could play and everything. But we all do this because we care 
and we want to do something great. We want to work with other people that also want to do something great. And so creating an environment that, that fosters and embraces and supports that type of kind of personal investment in the work itself is, is huge. Um, it, it results in a better experience personally, a more creatively satisfying uh, experience. And it, really at the end of the day, a better game better games, better, you know, bigger fan bases, um, more opportunities to do crazier and crazier and crazier things. I mean, that's how we've ended up with games that have gotten so big is they stack and stack and stack and stack. So and it all that all starts with day one with the culture. Like what is what is the experience of meeting the first person um, associated with a studio or a team um, or a company? And what does the first day feel like? And what does six months then feel like? And what does five years feel like? Um, so, you know, it's the entire, you know, Lauren, you talked about the life cycle. It's it's always thinking about not just one part of the picture, but the whole picture. Um, and that's that's what culture is for me. Oh, that's marvelous. Yeah, day one, six months, that is, ooh, we're gonna get into some of that later, but go ahead, Lauren, <laughs> what's your answer to that? <laughs> um, so why is it important for to have a positive culture? Yeah. Uh, it's super important because as, as Jake mentioned, in a creative industry, I think in general, at any organization, um, I, I love working in HR and in a support operations role, um, but making sure that you spend a lot of time at work. And if it's a place where people feel included and like they belong and they have a say and they're valued and recognized for that, um, they're going to be better fulfilled, which it, it it's kind of the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Then uh, you're going to have better products, but also the people uh, are going it, it, to, it has a huge impact on the environment and you want to love where you come to work every day. Um, that's something you spend a lot of time there. So, and you spend a lot of time with the people that you work with. And people are a big part of culture. So uh, that's where uh, we spend a lot of time and effort and energy investing in what is best for our people. Absolutely. Gems already. I love it. Yes. And we just got started in our show. So we're going to play a quick video from the Virtuous NA team. You hang out with us every last Wednesday of the month and you roll with us through our releases. But we definitely want to make sure that y'all have a great understanding of Jake, his team and what they do. So let's play that video, please. Virtuos is uh, one of the largest uh, game developers in the world. It's a company that we started in 2004 in uh, China. We help game studios produce bigger games. We also help game companies take their games to every platform uh, available on the market. We have one of the biggest art teams in the world, with more than a thousand artists, and we keep growing. Every year we have more and more top developers and publishers coming to us. Many developers now look at Virtuos as an extension to their team. The reason for this is because when they work with Virtuos, they know that they are going to get the level of quality that is expected. For over a decade, we've had the opportunity to partner with studios large and small throughout North America, including contributions to many of today's most iconic franchises. It's only natural that in support of those endeavors, we establish roots in North America to aid in fostering that air of collaboration. And as modern development practices lean towards truly open, collaborative development environments, we've seen those partnerships blossom. We are passionate about bringing characters to life. Our specialized team focuses on every nuance of the character creation, rigging, and animation processes. We create solutions to achieve our clients' goals. We then continue to meet and exceed rising quality bars. I wanted to become an animator to tell stories. The work we do allows us to really give our own moments into the characters we're portraying. In terms of an art sense, I think that's initially why you want to be an artist, is to express yourself. And what we do on a daily basis allows us to be artists. The secret sauce of our success is our team's passion for animation and innovation. We take pride in taking our clients' ideas and transforming them into reality on screen. When passion and pride are paired with skill and organization, an abundance of creativity is possible.
Awesome, awesome. Well, I hope that shed a little bit more light about Virtuous North America and all the cool things that they're up to, but hang in there, stay tuned because we got a lot more great information coming. So thank you to everybody in the audience who answered uh, the kickoff question. So we're gonna read um, a couple of them. Um, actually, Jeff Bob, you know, you were the first one to answer and you have a really great answer. So Jeff Bob said, if he had to zero in on one quality of culture that all game studios should consider, uh, they would say diversity, um, that it should be standard. So it really, hmm, sorry, I am misreading this answer. My bad. Let me start over. Um, diversity is important. Um, but for him, that should just be a standard, you know, so it doesn't really satisfy the question. That's an excellent point. And we're going to dive into that just a little bit later. Um, everybody should feel included. Team building days, work vacations to get em the employees to get to know each other and become more friends than just colleagues. Love that answer. Thank you so much for responding. Um, Jill popped up with another answer. She says, I think transparency is important for a good company culture. Absolutely. So thank you both very much for answering. And now we are going to move into the next round of questions <laughs> for Lauren and Jake. So I think it's important to do a little bit of level setting. See what I did there? Um, when it comes to the content matter that we'll be discussing. So before we get started, can you both define what culture means to you in your own words to your respective organizations? Uh, Lauren, would you mind starting? Sure. Culture is what happens, uh, whether you are intentional about it or not. It's the actions, the behaviors, the things that are, make up the organization, and it happens day one. So if you're not focused on culture as an organization, it's it may not develop in the way that you would hope or want it to. So uh, it's if you're pro proactive and intentional about it from the beginning, uh, that's the better way to build a better culture and uh, in, the, in an intentional way so you get the results that you want and you uh, are providing an environment where people want to come to work. So it, it happens whether you're, you're proactive about it or not. So it's better to be proactive. Absolutely. Jake, uh, what does culture mean to you? Can I, can I just steal her answer? <laughs> yeah, that, that was pretty good. I stole it from someone else. Uh, who but, uh, here, so. um, you know, culture is one of those things you can't, you can't dictate. You can't say, you know, here, here's our team and here's what we're going to do. And this is how everybody's going to act. And this is how everybody's going to think and everything like that. There's, there's an organic nature to it. Um, and so it's, you know, kind of stealing from what I said earlier, it, it's creating an environment for people to help, to help people self-identify and to help them bond with each other, to create relationships internally, um, and to foster a, and to foster a safe space for creative endeavors um, as as it relates to the video game industry. So, um, I mean, that's that's what I'm thinking about all the time. And sometimes those are, there are things that we can influence, and there are sometimes things that we shouldn't influence, that we should let them grow and expand and self-identify within the organic nature of how it evolved over time. No, that's excellent. And speaking of the difference between things that you can influence and things that should just happen organically, um, let's talk about how studio values or mission statements come into play. So um, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's something that it can be intentionally done, something that can you know, maybe not as organic. It could be both, actually. So I'm going to stop pontificating and let the experts answer this question. Um, how do studio values and mission statements dictate culture? How do those two things work hand in hand? Uh, Lauren, would you mind going first? Sure. Uh I think that provides a framework and an anchor point for the day-to-day -day behaviors and decision making that people, it's a, it's a shared framework where people understand, okay, these are the expectations. Our mission statement and values uh, are very aspirational. Uh, and so it helps us to really check in with what is important and is this decision that we're making in line with what our stated values are. And so it, it, it's a balance between being intentional and providing that framework and structure and then giving people and empowering them and giving them the freedom to act in a way that is aligned with those values. So that that's how I see them working together. 
No, I love it. Jake, what do you think? Okay, I keep, I, I, I'm going to have to go first eventually because I keep uh, no, to steal your answers. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I think you're right. Is having is having those those kind of um, guiding light principles uh, is really important for us. It, it, it's trust, excellence, and positivity. Um, you know, those are their kind of three core tenets that we we try to follow. Um, you know, our, our company motto is we make games better together. So it's about the human element. It's about uh, the collaboration that exists. And because it is, we work in a collaborative medium that these these endeavors don't come to fruition without different people from different walks of life with different types of expertise and different skill sets that are working in coordination with each other to do something really great. Um, so, you know, setting those kind of guiding light principles that are in service of that essence of collaboration and doing great things together is a huge part of it. No, I love that. So um, remind me, what was it one more time? We building great things together? Uh, we make great games together. We make great games together. I love that. That's awesome. So to follow piggyback on that just a little bit, how did Virtuous come to adopt that? Like, did somebody just wake up in the morning and be like, this <laughs> is what we will be our guiding light? Or was there a process to it? Can you walk us through that just a little bit? I mean, the, the those those three pillars, the trust, positive, uh, trust, excellence, and positivity have been around since the beginning, right? Mm -hmm. It's, um, you know, trust, trust the people that you work with, whether they be sitting beside you, whether they be in a different department, whether they have a different role in the company is, is creating an environment where you can trust what other people say, that we act in, a, in a, with transparency, with honesty, um, sometimes with bluntness, but with understanding. Um, so, you know, trust is a, is a very complicated thing, especially in the, in the workplace. So making sure that we're always creating an environment where that's, that's supported and, and facilitated. Um, you know, the excellence part of it is we want to do great things. Um, you know, we're not, we don't want to settle for good is good enough. It's, we really want to do great things. And so striving for that excellence, knowing that to, doing something great means we can push ourselves even more in the future. Um, so that's where creating that creative environment, establishing that creative environment where people can take risks and failure is okay, is really, really important, especially when you circle back to culture and then the positivity is, is, is have a pragmatic attitude, like be excited about stuff. Um, you know, support your 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 colleagues and friends and those relationships that you build with them over time, um, and have a good time doing what you're doing. Because at the end of the day, there are a lot. You know, making video games is hard, but there's a lot harder things to do in the world, and we're all very blessed to be able to do this as a profession. So let's have a good time doing it. Let's be positive about it because there's it's it's fun, um, and we bring joy to millions and billions of people across the world. So. Like what's there not to be positive about? A big plus one to that. I love that. Um, so sticking with mission statements, the Shell Games mission statement, I actually like it quite a lot, but you know, I'm drinking all the Kool-Aid, so maybe that's not doing too much. Um, so creating experiences we're proud of with people we like to make the world a better place. So Lauren, how does that guide Shell Games' people first philosophy? It's a great question. So again, I, I talked to that it was very aspirational. So how does that translate into the details and the decision making? Uh, we also have principles that uh, are more granular that help us and in the HR team, um, amazing teams is the value that supports that people we like. What we don't mean by that is groupthink or just people that are like me. Uh, so what we mean by that is mutual respect and um, really evaluating candidates and people that are going to join our team. That's the biggest change and impact we have on our culture is the people that we bring in. Uh, and that's where the organic piece comes in. So making sure our processes of deciding who gets hired at Shell Games, that's a big piece of our culture, especially in, in the HR team. And one of the ways that we talk about that, we only hire people that have the skills and passion to make the best experiences possible. And passion can be a loaded term. Um, what we don't mean by that is 
burning yourself out and making sure that you're not having a sustainable workload. So that's one piece of it. Skills doesn't just mean technical ability. Technical ability is necessary, but not sufficient to be a member of our team. Um, we also look at catalytic skills. They're, I, they're often termed soft skills like collaboration, good communication, uh, things like that. That th That's what's important for us when we are trying to support our mission statement of creating experiences that we're proud of. Because if we have people that are really talented, really kind, really creative, we're going to have better experiences that we are proud of that ultimately make the world a better place. Absolutely. Bravo. Love it. Love it. So I think it is always very important to, one, talk about where you are now, but lessons learned along the way can be immense, like super helpful to people finding their own way, you know, in, in building their own culture. So positive company culture we've well established isn't something that you can order off of Amazon. You have to be intentional about it. And it certainly isn't built overnight. So what are some of the lessons uh, that stand out that you both have learned along the way? Jake, I'm going to let you answer first this time. <laughs> um, if I was to say a lesson, you know, that I, I've learned at a personal level is patience. Um, you know, as, as I've talked about, these things are incredibly challenging endeavors. And so understanding that not everybody is going to be at the top of their game every single day. Um, some people may have more knowledge about a certain aspect of development than another or a specific um, skill set. And so, you know, the helping each other, be patient with each other. Um, understand that failure failure is a critical part of success, especially in this industry. And so being there to help pick each other up when you fall when somebody else falls, knowing that they'll be there to pick you up when you fall, I think that's one of the, the biggest personal lessons I've learned um, as it relates to development in general and especially being part of a team of people that are doing something. Absolutely. Lauren, what do you think? Lessons learned. Uh, I think really I responded well to what you said at the end there, Jake. Uh, you can't just create something by yourself, especially in the games industry. Uh, so having a team that is supportive, um, that's a, that there can be growing pains. But when you have a core foundation of respecting people and valuing other people being empathetic and putting yourself in other people's place and not making assumptions about other people and where they're coming from or why they might be acting a certain way. That's important. So empathy is big. Um, and that goes along with making mistakes and uh, understanding that people are human. And um, so resiliency, I think, is important. Um, I know we've I, I've had setbacks in my own career. Uh, we've, I, I think part of our philosophy at Shell Games in development is having an iterative process. And so continuously, continuously evaluating what's working, what isn't working, and figuring out what tweaks we need to make. And so that's part of culture development as well. No, that's awesome. And I, I want to stick with that point for just a little bit. So you talked about... Um, iterating, seeing what's working, what's not working. Um, so let's, how often, if at all, do company principles or values change? Is it something that you do once and you never touch again? Or is it kind of a living document that needs to be, you know, reevaluated? Uh, Lauren, let's stick with you for that. For sure. Uh, so we have, I, I mentioned the print, the studio principles, which we have in beautiful Shell Games branded notebooks that the marketing team designed and got for us uh, that we give to new people. So we have 18 of them. And uh, I think my team and the HR team, we, we live in the amazing team section. Um, but those developed over time. I think we had the mission statement. We had the core values. Uh, the principles are hotly debated. Um, but what helps us is our studio leadership. Every six months, they have a mini retreat where they go and decide what the studio top priority is and how that supports our mission statement and our core values. So it's not necessarily the mission statement or the values changing. It's 
what are the actions and the behaviors and the priorities that we are doing to focus on for the next six months that is going to support and achieve that mission statement. Um, another thing, talking about lessons learned, I think diversity has always been very important to us as an organization, but that was one of the principles that was added a little bit later. Um, it's always been a principle since I've been here, and but we've also really taken deep looks at what that means to us and how we can support that because it is a value actively and proactively. So. No, nope. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, Jake, what's your take on that? Uh, so yes, again, um, you know, reevaluating them over time, I think is really, really important, right? Uh, what, what was true 10, 15 years ago was, there's differences 10 years ago and five years ago and today. And so there is a living element to it. Um, you know, those, as I mentioned earlier, some of those guiding light elements are still ones that we follow, but it's the actions that you're taking in the moment and in the months directly in front of you, months and years ahead of you, um, that are going to impact your ability to deliver on those principles. So reevaluating, not necessarily what it is that you're trying to achieve on kind of a macro level, but what you were doing to live by and to build an environment around those those ideals at a micro level, um, I think is the is the most important part. And you can change and add and everything like that and adapt to to times as, the, as things move along. Where the nature of of the company, you know, for us starting as a as a small team and growing into the size that we've we've achieved, I mean. There are factors that we have to take into consideration. Yes, I, I'm, I look over the team here in North America and, you know, not a couple of years ago, we were four or five people and now we're coming up on a hundred people and we're part of a company that has, you know, over 2000 people that has teams in different countries in the world. And what's the most important thing to us here is not necessarily the most important thing to somebody somewhere else in the group. And so um, knowing that it, it, it a central core tenants uh, there remains some degree of, of similarity um, and concreteness, while at the same time, the local execution of that changes based on the individuals and the team composition and, and um, local culture in and of itself. No, awesome, awesome. Wow. I hope all of y'all watching are learning as much as I am because I am taking notes as I'm listening and I already knew the questions that I was going to ask today. So um, thank you both very much for laying down the foundation of what positive culture is at Virtuos and Cell Games and some of the thought and intentionality that went behind establishing it, you know, and then also the work that you put in to continue to build it and grow it as everything evolves. So let's talk about how good culture can then invite good people you know so retention is definitely something that most companies want you know <laughs> to do you know you don't want people coming in and out um and having a really great culture can do wonders and making sure that people feel validated appreciated and they're excited about coming to work um so for the games industry, .biz Best Places to Work Award, Virtuos won the Education Award. And um, in doing just a little bit of perusing before the show, your initiatives are internal and they're also external as well. I would love to know, Jake, if you'd be willing to share some of the programs that you've put in place and um, organizations that you support or are involved with. Sure. Um, I mean, we have a number of them across the, the, the company, right? And, and like I've, you'll hear me probably hit on a couple of times is it's not always the same everywhere. Um, we do try to customize them a little bit to, to the local market and the nature of, of the team and everything like that. Um, speaking more specifically to North America, uh, we have things like every member of the staff is afforded an annual budget, uh, personal budget to, that they can use for training or education, whether that's they want to go take some community college classes on something because they think it's interesting or if they want to take a specialized course in something to do with game development or they have maybe you have an artist that's interested in design and they want to take some courses to learn some of that like it's it's having something set aside for them that helps facilitate the the self-starter i want to do this and so there's some sort of a vehicle to help them to kind of remove one of the barriers even if it's as simple as removing a, a financial barrier um we also have involvement with a number of 
different schools in the area, whether that to be through sponsoring game jams and having some of our staff participate in the game jams and seating ourselves in with various students and stuff like that, that are all kind of piling on each other and trying to make something. It's like, oh, well, you do this little thing over here. And so trying to impart like little nuggets of wisdom um, into the young, younger generation of developers. Um, we've got some kind of scholarship programs. Um, we have, you know, sophisticated, and, more overseas with, with some of our other teams that are larger in size, but some sophisticated trading programs. We do exchanges with different studios, whereas such and such person that, that, that's a lighting you know, specialist may come over and spend some time with a concept team and say like why they're doing certain things that helps inform something that's a different discipline type. And so we do all sorts of ex exchanges across departments and across the globe. Um, and we're always trying to come up with new things. So every year we it's kind of one of those things we keep stacking and stacking and stacking and stacking to the point where I could spend the rest of this time just rattling off all the various things that we're constantly doing. We have, we actually have over a dozen, I think it's a dozen or so dedicated staff to just think about what we can do relative to ongoing education. Um, so that's a, the tip of the iceberg, I suppose. That's pretty impressive. I love it. That's that's fantastic. And, you know, professional development is such an important thing, you know, giving Absolutely. back to allowing people to continue to learn and grow. Um, one, it benefits the company, but it also it does something for you. It's like, hey, my job cares about what it is that I want to do and learn and grow into. So no, that's amazing. And the tip of the iceberg, I can't I can't imagine what the rest of it is like. So that's kudos to you and congratulations again Thank for winning you. the education award. It is so needed and much appreciated. Um, so Lauren, one of the things that stood out to me when I was looking at a shell game was that anti-crunch culture was something that was put everywhere and was said loud and proud. And I didn't believe it until I got here. But let's talk about how having an anti-crunch culture at the studio empower and encourages its team members. Absolutely. Uh, well, a big reason why that is, uh, is because teams get better over time. That's something that's that plays into retention. Um, and they're only going to stick around if they feel fulfilled, like they're working on cool stuff that they're interested in and that they're not getting burned out. It's a sustainability issue. Uh, and people are our most valuable resource. I mean, they're a lot more than resources, but uh, that's how we do things. And if people are crunching consistently, then they're going to get burned out much faster. So that's why our culture um, supports things like a work-life balance, a paid time off that is really healthy and gives you the ability to take time off and totally away. I mean, we send reminders to our team members to say, hey, you haven't scheduled the rest of your days for this year. Make sure you you take some time off and, and the kind of like Jake was saying, nudging them to make sure that they are taking care of themselves because honestly, that is going to make them better human beings, individuals, because it, when you're feeling burned out, you're not going to be able to have as positive impact on your team members. And it's not good for you. There's so many bad effects. So many studies uh, are done. And so for us, it when you're able to meet your project responsibilities in a sustainable way, then you're able to, you're in a better mental space where you're able to speak up about, and, and that's part of the empowerment piece. We we empower people to speak up, okay, hey, this estimate didn't quite match what the actual work that was going to be done, um, which helps inform future development. Like it, it doesn't help anybody if people are secretly working on something because they're afraid to speak up uh, it, because it, it they said it was going to take this amount of time and it, it took a different Different amount of time. We also do crazy weird things at Shell Games, which is awesome. And that's part of the draw and the appeal for creative individuals. We blaze a lot of trails, technologically speaking, which is really fantastic. Um, but that means no one's done it before. There's not best practices. There's not, there's so many variables to that. And so when you empower people to speak up about 
the, the actual work that they're able to do, encourage them to share their thoughts on development. I mean, yes, we have a design department and our designers are amazing, but we the design input is not limited to somebody that has that in their title. Uh, good ideas can come from anywhere. And part of that is if people are not burned out, they're able to speak their mind, they're able to be honest and transparent. Joe mentioned transparency. That's a big, that's a big one for us um, from the project level to the organizational level all across the board. No, amazing answers, both of you. Thank you so much for that insight. We are going to pause real quick and take an audience question. So here lies Fred asks, and I think it's a great question, actually. How have you continued to cultivate company culture during the pandemic and more people working remotely? So, Jake, let's start with you for that one. <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> First off, um, it's... You know, there's only so many happy hours and game get together and play games and snacks that you can ship people and you know care boxes and stuff like that. Um, you know, for us, it comes. We try to do a lot of like little. It's it's trying to do a lot of little things that add up into something that's that's impactful. Um, you know, whether that be having open hours, like I have standing open hours where a certain time every day I pop into a thing, and some days I sit there by myself and just stare at a camera and do some work. And other days, a bunch of people pop in and we might talk about life. We might talk about a project. We might talk about anything. Trying to create avenues by which people can can connect with each other, interact with each other um, that are sometimes outside of the, well, at 2 o'clock, I need to be here. At 4 o'clock, I need to be there. And then at 5 o'clock, I've got to take the dogs for a walk kind of a thing. Um, I think that's been a huge part of it. Um, but it, it's not easy. Um, it's not easy in the slightest. Uh, Lauren, I don't know if you have some more. I, I'll be taking notes if you have some really poignant and exceptional answers to this one. Uh, I agree. I mean, the the fact that it's hard, it's hard in general to, it, it takes a lot of work and effort to build a positive, um, supportive work environment. But it's, it's definitely been hard, especially I think the uncertainty and um, the length uh, has definitely led to fatigue on so many levels. Um, so encouraging people to take breaks, encouraging people to um, connect when they can. Um, I think my answers are different now than I think earlier on in the pandemic because we tried a lot of things that maybe didn't work. Um, as an HR team, which I think we're it's time for us to do it again because we're still here. Uh, we called every member of the studio. So mm -hmm. um, that was something. And we called. We phone calls. So which it, I know it's it's not somebody that's wanting to extend your car warranty. But if you don't have someone's number. But we wanted a, a break from the screen. We wanted to give people an opportunity to have a different medium just to check in. Because I really miss people popping into my office and walking by and, and just having casual conversations. And people aren't necessarily going to do that in on themselves uh, in the pandemic, especially working from home. So being proactive as an HR team and reaching out, providing a lot of channels, a lot of, um, again, framework and structure for people to have coffee breaks in the morning where it's not talking about project work. I think, again, it comes back to that intentionality of what is this meeting for. And I think we've had to yeah. be a lot more intentional uh, about, okay, hey, I'm scheduling casual time, which is very counterintuitive, but it's not going to happen otherwise. And so yeah. um, we've done the trivia, we've done happy hours, uh, but everyone's tired of a screen. And so getting creative um, and we've, we've learned lessons. We had a matching a phone tag situation where we randomly assigned people that they wouldn't normally interact with. Because I think, too, a lot of the culture is around your project teams and the people that you're interacting with on a daily basis. So that I think teams have a good handle on and we empower them to communicate really well, engage them. And I think that they have really tight bonds because they're, again, having regular communication. But the different project teams and the maybe operations group. Um, so providing opportunities for that connection in somewhat artificial ways, but um, 
in ways that are not obvious. Yeah. So I don't know if we found the secret sauce yet, uh, but I think, again, transparency and realizing that with so much uncertainty in the world, what certainty can we provide? What certainty can we communicate and over communicate and like over communicate again, um, even if it changes? And yeah. I think that that's part of it, too. Yeah, we we try to do some secondary things now that the things are getting a little bit better and opening back up where we have you know, used to do the kind of casual coffee hour. It's like, well, casual coffee hour is now just like in person. So and you know, we, the studio is not necessarily open, but a few guys get together on Thursday between two and four o'clock or something like that. There's a credit card down at the local Starbucks. And you all can hang out and kind of, you know, and play around together. And some people show up and some people won't. Um, so trying to now do little things where you can't replicate the, the water cooler, but you can sort of create an artificial water cooler. Um, yeah, anything we can do, really. <laughs> We tried a virtual kitchen, uh, which did not work out. So that was an idea. Um, the kitchen is a, a hotbed of activity normally in our studio. Um, so we tried an open Google Hangout link uh, where anybody could just go in and try to. But the problem was it was so wide open that you there was never anyone in it at the, sa at the same time. So um, giving people less open opportunities and more targeted, short check-ins uh, with our management group uh, and our people managers. This is something we talk about a lot of, hey, maybe you go from one-on-ones that are regularly occurring monthly to shorter check-ins more frequently yeah. um, just to make sure people feel supported and, and they have what they need because things can go awry, especially when you're not um, interacting with them physically um, on a regular basis and you may not have any idea. Yeah. Communication. It's all about communication. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, no, that's fantastic. Thank you both so much for those detailed answers. We are going to take another question from the audience. So, hmm, I like that name. Hmm, has asked, has there ever been anything that hasn't been aligned with a positive work culture? I'm going to spin this question just a little bit uh, to tailor it to what you just discussed about having to pivot in the middle of a pandemic and how some things worked and some things didn't. So as you're iterating and you're going through these different things that you know, hey, let's try it and see if it sticks. Um, what process did you go through to be like, okay, well, this is a good idea, but it's not really working for our team members. So maybe we need to go back to the drawing board. Like what kind of guided that decision process as you evaluated some of the initiatives that you rolled out? Um, this is open to whoever would like to take it first. <laughs> I mean, like you have something to say. Oh, well, I was just gonna say, I, I think, the end of your your last uh, statement in terms of the frequency of check-ins and just asking people asking people. I mean, sometimes the answer is as simple as, "Do you guys like this? <laughs> and is this helping, or are are we being annoying uh, with all these little things that we're trying to do? Like, is it a distraction, or is it actually giving giving our team some sort of an outlet to connect with each other, or to relieve some sort of stress, or um, to take a break from something?" Um, I think that that feedback loop is, is the most important part of it. And the frequency, the frequency of intentional and yet small check-ins is probably one of the most important aspects of it. It's not a, hey, so I want to check in once a week for 15 minutes on Thursday at one o'clock, because then it just becomes another meeting. It could be as simple as a, hey, was that thing we did last Thursday? Did you have fun? Uh, some will say yes, some will say no, some will say we'd love to do more of it. And so having it more of an open aspect of stuff. And then every every once in a while, we'll do eh, quarterly or so, we'll do periodic question questionnaires, like anonymous questionnaires to the staff and saying, like, here's a bunch of stuff we did, just rate it on one to five. And if we find out that a bunch of people say it's one, it's like, well, I guess we'll stop doing that. Um, and if it's a bunch of fives, then we'll try to do more of that or something that's more in the vein of that. So it's it's really a intentional feedback mechanism that, that we utilize um, to try to find out kind of what works or what doesn't work. And we also have things like large group chats. And so sometimes we'll do something and a random organic conversation will break out, be like, wasn't that cool? And then we're watching that like, okay, that seems to work. Oh, that's 
That's great. Uh, Lauren, what do you think? Could you repeat your spin for me, Kat, on that question? Oh, yeah, sure. Let me actually make sure I remember my own spin on that. Um, so as during the pandemic, um, you know, some things worked, some things didn't. How did you evaluate, uh, you know, okay, well, this really isn't working. Let's try something else. Or if like, hey, you know, maybe we should just stick with this a little bit longer. Maybe it'll shake out. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, it's constant evaluation. <laughs> um, one of our principles that we've mentioned a few times is always ask if there's a better way. And I think that that um, Jake hit the nail on the head with feedback loop. A feedback loop is really important. Um, and so again, creating that structure of, and chan different channels for people. We have an anonymous sex suggestion box. We have uh, office hours. We have a lot of different ways. We encourage and empower managers to be checking in with their people regularly. Um, that's something that's super important. Um, and I think... <laughs> I think we've tried some things and based on feedback, it's like, okay, maybe that needs a tweak. Maybe that needs, um, maybe people just aren't in a place where that makes sense right now. Um, so I think phone tag was a mixed bag. I think the people that engage, we didn't, we didn't make it uh, required, um, but we have a lot of introverted people in the studio that the the perceived barrier to reaching out to somebody that you may not know outside of your team structure, that's intimidating. And so we tried to provide, okay, let's make it, let's gamify it. We're a bunch of game developers. <laughs> let's, let's do a point system. We're going to give a Amazon gift card for however many points you do. And that was an iterative process too. And I gave people a question bank because I, I think too, giving people uh, resources and and not uh, not having vague goals or vague opportunities to uh, to talk, you have to be more specific. And so giving people a, a point structure, like, okay, if you don't want to talk personally about personal things, here's a very surface level, fun, casual conversation starter. If you want a three point conversation and you want to go deeper and get to know that person in a different way, yeah, here's here's a whole other question bank. Um, so giving people something and resources to use uh, as those tools uh, to build those communication skills and to foster and facilitate and support that um, th that that that's something that we think about a lot. So I would say it's a, I mean, my, my team meets weekly, uh, more, more than once a week to talk about, okay, how, where are we now? What's the situation and how can we make this better for people? No, that's awesome. I hope if y'all are not taking notes on how to build a better culture, how to open up your game studio, or just how to be, you know, more positive in your workplace and the influence that you carry within you um, to to establish culture. Now's a great time to start. We have about I can't believe how quickly this hour has flown by. It is 648 y'all. <laughs> well, 648 Eastern, Jake. I'm not sure if you're on the East Coast with us or not. Um, so it, might, it looks like an early afternoon over there. <laughs> Uh, it's a bright and sunny 3.48 in the afternoon for me. <laughs> Uh, so um, we are going to head into the last little bit of our programming. Um, we have already discussed how to build the foundation for positive culture, how good gaming culture invites good people and encourages them to stay there. Now we're going to head into a topic that's near and dear to my heart, diversity and positive culture and how that can create better games. So. We have covered a lot of territory tonight, but uh, Jake, I would love to start with you. So the three pillars that you mentioned, you know, having a studio based on mutual trust and respect helps create the experiences that Virtuos has made. So how does diversity factor into your organization, especially because y'all are global, y'all are around the world? <laughs> I mean, that's that's one of the fundamental principles of the company, right? Is <laughs> we are people from around the world all working together every day. So, um, you know, it's, 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 it is who we are. Um, now, we, we strive for diversity locally as well, because it, it's, it's important that not just as a global company with, with studios in different locations, that makes us diverse. Like we want a diverse, diversity of local um, staff as well, because working one-on-one -on -one in proximity to each other, um, I think there are 
so many stories and experiences to be leveraged relative to making games that the more of that that you can get, the more sources of that that you can get in the same room, the better, right? And that's, I mean, you can look at all of the different stories and experiences and stuff like that that people have, have published and shared over the years um, about this really great idea for this mechanic or this story element or everything came from somebody because they were from this part of the world and they grew up in this place or they saw this thing or they read this book or they saw this movie in this foreign language that nobody else on the team saw. Um, it's just a, it's a fundamental part of what we're doing. And so the idea of limiting the opportunities based on the composition of the team is self-defeating, like in the form of, so um, it's a fundamental part of who we are. It's a fundamental part of what we want to be. It's a fundamental part of how we intend continue to grow and expand. Um, and that's on every, every front, right? Whether it's, whether it's a, a geographic thing, whether it's an orientation thing, whether it's a gender thing, like at the end of the day, like we are game developers and the rest of it is just something, right? So bring them all in, let's get them all in the room, let's do cool stuff together, let's get influences from other things, other experiences, let's integrate them all together, let's figure out how we can stitch something fun together. Um, and that's a complicated thing to do, but at the same time, it's how it should be done because that's the thing that's going to provide us the best experience as creative people and to the fans that ultimately end up playing something. So. Oh, absolutely. And I, I love the fact that, you know, even though Virtuous is a global company, you're still making an effort to be diverse in the studio spaces, in the places that you operate. That is powerful. I love it. So kudos, props, all the woohoo. Like, that's amazing. I love that. Um, so Lauren, diversity makes us strong is something that Shell Games stands by. So while we can apply that to the variety of projects that the studio works on or how people look or their orientation, how can diversity makes us strong be applied to more than that? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's it's something we have thought about a lot because it is such a principle, but that can mean so many things. And so for us, um, one of the most, for me personally, I'll speak for me personally, one of the most exciting things has been the democratization of tools that allows more people to be experimental and build their portfolios in a way that wasn't really possible several years back. I mean, even the, the time that I've been at Shell Games, um, we have expanded our talent pipeline and the places we look for talent. That's we, We've partnered with organizations like Game Devs of Color Expo, which is such a phenomenal event. Um, there is so there are so many elements of diversity. And for us, um, be, in support of our mission statement to make the world a better place, games have to be representative of the people that live in the world. And uh, that has not always been the case. And that's something that we're really passionate about. And we're continually improving. And uh, I don't think there's ever a point at which you're done and you can say, oh, we achieved this goal and we can just kind of rest now. Um, so again, that ties back to I'll always ask if there's a better way. Um, and the other thing is, too, it's been so exciting to see so many game development programs across the U.S. Um, expand because not everyone has the opportunity to go to a master's level program um, that that can be cost prohibitive for people. Um, there may not be those. So the, the increase of opportunities of getting people into the games industry is something that we are very interested in continuing to explore ways from where people from all different backgrounds. So diversity means perspectives and backgrounds and lived experience, which can be so different from person to person. Um, and that's something that we strive for and will continue to work towards. And having people in alignment at all levels of the organization, it's something that everyone's responsible for. So not just HR, not just the executives, not just the hiring managers, not just the people on the floor, especially when you're working to build the most inclusive environment possible. People are very different and that mean, that can be a lot of different things. And so you have to continuously evaluate and check in, okay, 
are we doing what's best for the team and for the studio and the world at large and the people that are looking to join our studio and play our games? Absolutely. No, thank you so much for that. That's that's awesome. I'm inspired. I don't know if y'all are inspired, but I'm inspired. <laughs> so no, thank you both so much for your time this evening. We have six minutes left and I'm going to still, I'm going to squeeze every little bit of knowledge that I can in those last six minutes. So let's flip it for just a second um, and, and adopt a different perspective. So if I'm looking to get into the gaming industry or I'm on the hunt for a company or a studio that has a positive culture and really, really cares about it, what questions should I be asking? What should I be looking for? I'll let you think for a minute because that's, that's a, I think this question is going to help a lot of people. <laughs> Jake, would you like to go first? Lauren, Jake, whoever? <laughs> so I'm going to say something that may be a little bit unconventional. Okay. Um, is we, we try really hard, really hard to make the interview process or make that first exposure process um, very informal and very, um, I don't know if casual is the right word, but representative of what the dialogue and what the experience of working at the company is gonna be like, right? Mm -hmm. So the idea of coming in and being stuffy about stuff and reviewing every point in a resume and all that kind of stuff, um, we kind of skip that. And we go straight to the like, hey, what do you like to do? Like one of the first things I asked everybody, like, what are your favorite games of all time? And we might talk about that for 20 minutes before we were like, no, I also saw that you worked at this other place or you've never worked at this. Like getting to know um, each other and having someone on the, you know, if you're interviewing for something, if you're coming into the game industry for the first time and you feel that there's a genuine connection with the individual who is essentially the representative of the culture, like they're the tip of the spear. There's a reason why they're doing the interviews is because they're either running the team or they're you know they're trying to identify people that'll fit in so if you create chemistry with that person um it's a very good representation of what's going to be on the other side of that hiring process and so it's a two-way street just look for experiences where that dialogue emerges naturally and organically is an enjoyable and it doesn't feel like you're sweating the entire time and you've got to go wring out your shirt after the interview process like that shouldn't be the experience and as, as the company is like, be honest and be transparent and have those representatives that are going out and talking to people be themselves because you want people that are going to work together and fit together and play together um, and being each other just like you would out in the, the larger world. Like you find friends by saying, I like this thing. Do you like this thing? You like that thing. Let's talk about that thing. Um, and we all have at least one thing in common we like these things so like why not start there and talk about that a little bit yeah i love that lauren sorry so what they what our viewers should be looking for or what we should be looking for or both ah so what uh, a viewer or a per person who's looking to get into the gaming industry should be looking for Oh, yes. Okay. Uh, so culture, I mean, I can, I would say, be specific about your questions about somebody's uh, company's culture. Uh, if you just ask, what's your, I mean, you can start with what's your culture like, but you can also, uh, if you've done your research, uh, and you're talking to a company representative, and there's I mean, at this this day and age, people and companies should be talking about their culture in their external media. That's that's kind of a given. Uh, so then you can ask more detailed, tailored questions of, OK, is what this person that I'm talking to uh, are there a lot? Is there alignment with what I'm seeing in the rest of the with the company public facing says? Um, so if you have that opportunity, make sure you're asking specific questions about how the culture uh, matches what you're looking for in an organization. We talk a lot about culture ad. What is this person that bringing that's different and unique and can really level up our culture and level up our teams and our departments? Um, we don't talk about culture fit because I think fit implies um, there's one particular way to to be or to do something. And so um, we want a culture match. We want pe and 
if you're matching the needs of the organization, the needs of the organization should be inclusive and welcoming and looking for somebody that is going to continue to add to that and contribute. So. No, th those were fantastic answers. And I hope that anybody who's tuning in or watches this VOD later, um, they you'll have a better sense of knowing what questions to ask, how to approach. And, you know, even in that interview process, as Jake mentioned, getting a feel for the culture of the company, um, because, you know, everybody puts on their best impression, their best first impression, you know, but it's not very hard to identify authenticity when you come across it, especially if it's baked into that company and they're not changing the script. They live it, breathe it, they walk it every day, you know, so very, very fortunate to have Jake and Lauren with us tonight as leaders um, in best places to work. So we are out of time. I can't believe it because I still have questions, but I'm not going to hold you hostage. So let's end, <laughs> uh, start to bring things home with a closing question. So what is your greatest hope for the evolution of company culture in the gaming industry? I, I have an answer, Jake. Would you like to get first? <laughs> um, I would love for diversity, equity, and inclusion to just be the norm and not be an emphasis and a focus. Um, I, th I think that we will continue to make it such as, as long as it needs it. And I think we'll need it for a, a good, good long time um, because there's a lot of room to grow and work to do. Um, but I would love it if that was just baked into the DNA of all organizations and it wasn't something that you had to read think pieces on uh it was it was just truly representative of the world around us that's my beautiful dream plus one to that <laughs> jake plus two um, <laughs> yeah ha having having that aspect of of our industry normalized to some degree or right? where it doesn't have to be a focus would be a wonderful time um i think the other thing for me that is you know obviously a hot button topic as well is is finding as an as an industry right as we're trying to do it on local levels but that balance between work passion and life um i, I still think it's something that we struggle with uh, as a culture inside the industry is we do care so much we do want to do great things we do want to have um you know provide the best experience to our fans and everything like that and sometimes that we pour maybe a little bit too much of ourselves into it and so doing a better job with each other and, and saying, hey, you know, hold it back a little bit, like being accountable to each other, um, putting some restraints in place and stuff like that, it, I think is really important for the sustainability. Um, you know, there's there's just way too many stories of people that did amazing things over a two, three, five year span and then just walked away from game development entirely and did literally anything else. So um, that that sustainability of balance I think is what I would, if I was dreaming of something that we could change, that would be the thing. Oh, well, you know what? I'm clicking my heels three times and, you know, whatever else needs for both of those visions to happen, because you talk about revolutionizing an industry. Um, first, thank you both uh, for your time this evening and for the insights you. that you provided. Um, Again, I'm inspired. I'm going to rewatch this and and really, really dig in and listen without being like, okay, well, what's the next question I'm going to ask? <laughs> you know, what was the comment that Jake said? So I can feed that up uh, to, to Lauren as well. Um, but this has been amazing. So before we close, I wanted to open the floor for any last comments, any, you know, exciting new announcements that might be coming out, anything that you want to share. Um, we are dropping your social handles for your companies below. Um, but yeah. Um, anything? Last last words, last thoughts? Uh, Jake, would you like to start? <laughs> uh, I mean, no big news. I'd say that you know we're all, like I said, we're a global company. We're hiring everywhere from from Europe, Europe to Asia to North America. Um, so you know, check out our what you know website, richardcam.com, and there's a careers page and see if there's there's somewhere in the world that you want to be. If there's a good job sitting there for you. Uh, we're always recruiting and always growing. Um, and yeah, just to you know, find that balance for those of you who are developers and for those of you who are entrants into the industry, like demand, demand balance, demand that we all be better. 
I love right. that. Yeah. That should be on a uh, t-shirt. <laughs> Absolutely be on a t-shirt. <laughs> Um, I don't know. I'll just jump in. Uh, if you're in the Pittsburgh area and you're looking for something to do after high school, um, we are establishing a partnership with a local community college uh, with an apprenticeship program. So talking about removing barriers to getting into the industry, uh, we're trying to pioneer a education slash work model um, apprenticeship program. So more to come in the near future. Um, Kat and Jill don't hate me for, for announcing this before <laughs> we're, all the PR is out, but it's something we've been working on and really excited about for a long time. So um, we are going to partner with them and it's going to be a fully funded um, education certification degree uh in multimedia and gaming and uh then we'll also pay uh, the apprentices for the work that they're able to contribute so it's uh, fully sponsored and you get to work with great people in a great environment uh but you, ha you do have to be a ccac student to do it so that is community Ca uh community college of allegheny county in pittsburgh in the pittsburgh area so that's a that's something that we're really excited about we're really passionate about um figuring out ways to to make the industry look different and be better and in, a, in the best possible way. See, I love shell games and I also love to learn. So maybe I'll go apply and see what y'all can do. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, oh, no, also, if you have questions about uh, anything hiring related, uh, careers at shellgames.com is a great uh, uh, resource for us. Yes, absolutely. Thank you both for um, providing those, that insight and for our tech team for dropping those links. Um, and before we sign off, thank you everybody who tuned in tonight. Um, chat has been lively. Thank you for all the great questions, for the positive comments, for the feedback. We hope that you've learned something. Um, and for those that had to jump off early, you know, thanks for hanging out as long as you could. Um, hope that you also enjoyed your time with us as well. Um, thank you again so, so much, uh, Jake and Lauren, for your time this evening, afternoon, afternoon, evening, <laughs> this time out of your day to, to give us some insight and wisdom, you know, that will hopefully guide this industry forward. And as stated, will become more of a norm, you know, across the board. So fingers crossed that that happens soon. I mean, we're already seeing it happen and just hoping that that continues. Um, if you haven't already and you tuned in, if you find yourself hanging out with us every last Wednesday of the month to tune in for dinner with the devs, but you haven't subscribed yet, you absolutely should. What you waiting for? This is your invitation to do so. So that way you don't miss a beat. You don't miss a thing. Uh, we have an incredible lineup of different topics. We have special guests. You know, we field a host of topics um, in different conversations. So make sure that you subscribe um, and hit that notifications button so you don't miss anything. Last bit of housekeeping, next month we will be having dinner with the devs, but because of the holiday, we're gonna do it a little bit early. So November 17th is when we will be holding our next dinner with the devs and stay tuned for more information about next month's topic. Spoiler alert, it's a great one. Uh, thank you so much again for everybody who tuned in. Thank you, Lauren, Jake, stay safe out there, be kind, do great things, and we will see you next time. Bye. Thank you for Thanks, having me. everyone.